It's a very warm welcome to all our viewers and welcome to a new episode of The Daily Debate, our show bringing you all the latest news and events happening all around the world. And of course, today we have a lot in store for our viewers. We focus on Egyptian diplomatic ties and strides, of course, highlighting Egypt's growing regional and international significance. And uh, joining us this evening in our studios uh, is our guest, Dr. Miled Montez, the international relations expert, who will be telling us and discussing many issues under debate tonight. It's a very good evening to you, Dr. Miled, and thank you very much for your time, sir. Thank you. Dr. Now today, uh, President Abdel Fattah Sisi congratulated Donald Trump on his win in the 2024 U.S. Uh, presidential election. The uh, head of state posted on his social uh, media account saying he extends his congratulations to President-elect Donald Trump, wishing him luck and success with fulfilling the interests of the American people and he looked forward together they'd achieve and maintain peace and security in the region. This in addition to consolidating strategic ties between Egypt and the United States as well as their peoples. The two countries have always set an example of collaboration, succeeding to fulfill their mutual interests which they aspire to continue during the critical conditions that the world is going through. Trump has surged ahead with 267 of the 270 electoral votes required for a White House victory Whilst Kamala Harris only got 224 votes, as uh, has been reported. Right, uh, Dr. Millet, of course, uh, let me start by asking you, did you expect this result? Actually, you know, you know in politics, we don't usually actually make expectations mm. because we all, we, what we do always is that we weigh in mm. the pros and, and cons for whatever or whoever the candidates. Mm. But in actuality, my understanding or my guts, you know, would always tell me that the direction uh, for the Democratic Party is not okay, paved in the way that would help them mm. staying at the White House. Yes. Uh, the American people were not satisfied by all means with the, the Democratic administration. Mm. And let me extend the notion of what I've just said that the entire world was not satisfied, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And the pitfalls and the drawbacks of the Democratic administration, in actuality, once again, I think they were so and evidently, I wouldn't use words as bad, but it was... Lacking. L lacking, mm -hmm. uh, reluctant. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we wouldn't get it until today, by the way, for example, in the Middle East, we have been listening to endless promises coming from Washington, D.C., that we will stop okay, the ongoing agony of the Palestinians mm. in, in, okay, in Daffa, in Gaza, and now we're talking about Lebanon as well. What happened is nothing, literally nothing at this all. Regard, yes. So uh, I, think, I think Arabs, I'm talking about Arabs in, in the region, and not only Arabs, even, you know, youngsters and Gen Z, Generation Z in the United States of America, and I think they have lost hope in the Democratic administration. Mm -hmm. Let me put it straightforwardly, mm -hmm. because they, ha they were hoping that something concrete would happen, yes. something decisive would happen. The administration would be ab able to put an end to that kind of ongoing agony mm -hmm. and suffering of civilians, of innocent people who are unarmed. But nothing happened mm -hmm. by all means. This actually, Dr. Millet, leads me to my next question now with regards to, you know, following Donald Trump's election win. What might Donald Trump's return to office influence when it comes to U.S. foreign policy, specifically uh, in the Middle East? Do you expect any changes, any action on the ground? More decisiveness. Mm. Despite the fact that I know so many people who have been following, and myself in some previous interviews, yes, of course, analyzing his attitudes, his talks, his words, his uh, thoughts on the Middle East, because wholeheartedly he was supporting Israel. But at least I would know where he's going. I need to know someone, or I need to get to know someone who is obvious, who is clear about his views, mm -hmm. but misleading views. And uh, on the outside, you would tell me that we are wholeheartedly with peace, 
but behind our backs, you would supply our enemies with the latest and the most sophisticated weapons in the world. I think that's very much unacceptable. If, if I may use only mildly the word unacceptable, mm -hmm. but this hypocrisy. You tell me in my face, I'm not willing to help you. I'm not going to actually stop the war. I'm very much helping the enemy. I would actually get to know this mm -hmm. in my face. And I think uh, Donald Trump is that kind of person. He is that type of character yes. that he would tell everyone, for example, I'm not satisfied with this. He would tell the person in his face that I'm not getting this, I'm not doing this. And when it comes to sitting at the same table, I'm talking about doing diplomacy. Mm. In my mind, it's much more easier to deal with someone like Donald Trump. Yes. It, it, that's my understanding. Mm. Why? Because he's clear, he's obvious. It doesn't take time. He, when he says no, it's a no. Yes. It means no. Yes. When it says yes, it says yes. It's very decisive indeed. Exactly. Um, now, Dr. Millet, given President Sisi's uh, emphasis in his message about uh, strategic ties, how do you see you know, Egypt and the United States enhancing their relationship, their cooperation as well, in addressing pressing regional issues? We're talking the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, uh, other crises as well, like Libya, Sudan, Lebanon, etc. The situation in the Middle East, I think it's, it's beyond words. Mm. And I think, uh, you know, the English dictionary itself, we try to look up some words. I think we're out of words because it's not only, you know, entangled or complex. I think it's beyond all of this because you would feel it's like a dominant theory to me. It's everything is connected. Everything, whatever, whatever, whatever we talk about this in the Middle East, it's connected. Egypt is very much connected to Sudan and what's going on in Sudan. Egypt is very much connected to Libya, Every, okay, same way with Gaza and Palestinians. What's going on in Lebanon, we are directly connected to despite the fact that I know geographically speaking Lebanon, we're not next to Lebanon. Mm -hmm. However, I'm talking about when it comes to the impact of that uh, conflict, I think we are connected to this. Mm -hmm. We get impacted. So my first priority, my understanding is that the first priority and I think, you know, President Abdel Fattah Sisi, in a couple of days from now, we'll be calling Donald Trump because we need to act and we need to act quickly. And I mean it swiftly. Mm -hmm. It's time. And unfortunately, we don't have time. We are beyond time. Mm -hmm. It's been more than a year now. Nothing happened on the ground. And I think everyone is following what's happening in Gaza now. I think we've been seeing the situation in the northern region of Gaza it's getting worse and even people there they are saying that it's much worse even worse than it started mm. so the situation is getting worse we have to stop this as soon as possible we have to set at a table as I said and I think dealing with someone like this at the White House I think we might get to something and I, I maybe grammatically speaking I should put it this way we must get to something as soon as possible because actually you know you know, continuing in that kind of agony, I think that would result in some disastrous things, especially with uh, Israel wanting and pursuing something which is pretty, pretty weird to most of people in the world, that they are trying to escalate the situation nonstop. Mm -hmm. Okay, going from Lebanon to Syria to Iraq, and of course the confrontation with Iran back and forth mm -hmm. nowadays, mm -hmm. it's been a couple of months now, so I think decisiveness is the main key to stopping all of this in the Middle East. So cooperating with Washington, dealing with Washington, I think Egypt has been trying for the last, I think since October 7th, okay, to get to some sort of a middle ground with Washington. Unfortunately, it's, uh, it hasn't been successful. Mm -hmm. It hasn't, despite the fact that Egypt has been doing that, as I said, okay, nonstop. We have been trying to get some sort of a deal. Yes. Okay, Washington has been promising us in the Middle East that don't worry, we get to this. And, uh, you know, the different visits, multiple visits yes. of the Secretary of State, mm. we haven't seen anything. Yes. And Concrete, we are yes. hoping, all of us in the Middle East, that, okay, the elect president, Mr. Donald Trump, would sit at a table and would actually give us something concrete once again. We need a plan. We need an action plan, especially with the changes, the latest changes to the Israeli cabinet. And the, okay, yes. 
the resignation of the Secretary of Defense. Defense. Mm. Okay, I think we need actually to see what's happening, mm. what's on that guy's mind. We have to see this and we have to deal with this as soon as possible. And I believe, despite the fact that I know the news, and myself, I told you, we've been talking about this, the relation between uh, Netanyahu and Trump, it's a strong relationship between the two actually okay, guys, mm -hmm. you know. However, I believe, and some people actually have been very much susceptible about this, uh, and they suspect that that would result in very negative results. Personally speaking, I believe the best person to uh, put pressure on Netanyahu is Donald Trump. If he means to do this, if he wants to do this, he would actually put pressure on the guy and he would tell him that, okay, do this. And I think most likely Netanyahu would do this. But with uh, Joe Biden, I think he wasn't listening actually mm. to Joe Biden. And we have heard, you know, the last year about some confrontations and tense phone calls between That's the true. two of them. And I think situation and hopefully Okay, the situation will change in the coming, hopefully, weeks. Indeed. Uh, just to wrap up uh, the latest with regards to the U.S. elections and Egyptian ties with the United States, how might Trump's uh, policies uh, impact U.S.-Egyptian economic as well as security collaborations in the near future, specifically in various areas, for example, of investment uh, in critical sectors in Egypt? Actually, let me remind our dear viewers of something happened in his first term. Mm as he was uh, at the White House. Uh, I still recall that uh, under President Obama's administration, they held back some very crucial weaponry. Mm. And they didn't want to actually supply Egypt with, with such advanced weaponry. And we needed this very badly, especially combating terrorists in, uh, yeah. in Sinai. Mm -hmm. And I still recall actually President Trump actually approved this mm. as he got into office at the White House. And I think that wasn't only what a mere gesture. It was a measure. It was something that he, he meant to do. He got the fact that, okay, that the situation in Sinai was so critical. And it was so, actually, uh, it was very important for yes, Egypt mm -hmm. to deal with the situation. By the way, nowadays in Sinai, the situation is completely different. Mm. Completely different, and I mean it anyone goes to Sinai nowadays, he would feel that level of security. Absolutely. Okay, so I think that paved the way and opened the door for so many things actually to happen later on in Sinai. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have been able, okay, for example, to uh, launch a new, okay, for example, business or mm -hmm. whatsoever of uh, business endeavors there in Sinai without that kind of, you know, action that actually, you know, Donald Trump helped Egypt with so I mentioned that example to remind everyone that when it comes to doing business, doing business is very much tied to security. Yes, absolutely. And uh, uh, that person at the White House will be at the White House in January. And I think he gets this, he understands this, and he gets actually the situation because it was his first term, mm -hmm. first time at the White House. Yes. Okay, but now he's very much acquainted with the situation. He knows actually what's happening in Egypt and mm -hmm. the Middle East, so he gets this very well. Absolutely. And I believe when it comes to doing business, I'm hoping, personally speaking, that the next phase, I think, would be more flourishing, I'm talking about economically speaking, between Cairo and Washington, mm -hmm. okay, because he gets the situation. By the way, okay, when it comes to someone doing business like Donald Trump, Okay, not only in, in terms of policy, because I mentioned that a couple of minutes ago, mm. but in terms of uh, striking deals mm. when it comes to this doing is business. His, uh, this is his arena, absolutely. Yeah, it's, he's a businessman first. He's a businessman. <laughs> yes, indeed. Right, uh, so that wraps up uh, the latest situation in the United States. Let's move to another uh, topic today. President Abdel Fattah el Sisi hosted the Estonian president, Alok Karas, on his inaugural visit to Egypt. Uh, their discussions focused on expanding cooperation in critical sectors and also addressed shared global challenges and exploring trilateral initiatives in Africa. We have more details on this visit in this report. In a joint press conference at Tahideya Palace, President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi extended a warm welcome to Estonian President Alar Karis, marking the latter's first official visit to Egypt. 
President Sisi underscored the significance of this visit, emphasizing both nations' dedication to fostering closer ties and seizing new opportunities for collaboration. The President expressed optimism for an expanded partnership in critical fields, notably energy mining, education and food industries, building upon their ongoing cooperation in telecommunications, information technology and digital transformation, a sector where Estonia is globally recognized for its expertise. President Sisi highlighted the shared vision between the two countries for deepening economic trade and investment relations, commanding President Karis for bringing a delegation of Estonian business leaders and investors eager to explore collaborative opportunities in Egypt. The head of state emphasized the importance of ongoing political consultations and technical exchanges focusing on strengthening ties across sectors like technical training, artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. Both leaders agreed on the potential for trilateral cooperation projects in Africa which would promote development across the continent. Security and stability in the Middle East were central to the discussions with President Sisi stressing Egypt's commitment to peace in the region. The Palestinian issue took priority in the talks with President Sisi reiterating Egypt's position that a sovereign Palestinian state based on the June 4, 1967 borders is essential for lasting stability. President Sisi expressed concern over ongoing Israeli escalations in Gaza, Lebanon, urging immediate de-escalation and an end to the violence. The presidents also discussed global challenges including the crises in Libya, Syria, Sudan, Yemen, the stability of the Red Sea and the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. President Sisi emphasized the need for increased international cooperation to address food and energy security issues, calling for peaceful resolutions to ongoing conflicts to ensure global stability. President Sisi reiterated Egypt's commitment to a strong partnership with Estonia, voicing optimism for ongoing collaboration and alignment on international issues. The President expressed hopes for further strengthening bilateral relations and continued dialogue on regional and global challenges, affirming that Egypt and Estonia stand ready to work together for peace and prosperity. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, welcoming in the studio my guests for this uh, evening's edition of the Daily Debate, Dr. Meled Mumtez, our international relations expert. Once again, Dr. Meled, it's a pleasure to have you with us this evening. Now, of course, President Abdel Fattah Sisi today uh, met with the Estonian uh, president, Alain Karas. Quite a historical, uh, you know, visit in itself. How might this visit uh, redefine Egyptian-Estonian relations? What are some of the immediate outcomes you expect? You know, let me start by actually highlighting the geographical significance of Estonia. Yes. Estonia, because I think, you know, I think some people maybe they don't know where it is. Mm -hmm. Estonia is the northeast of Europe, Europe on the Baltic Sea. And it's one of the previous or ex-Soviet states. Mm -hmm. In my mind, okay, geographically speaking, maybe some viewers would say that, okay, what, uh, ge it's far away country, you know, why we do that? Mm -hmm. And I think Egypt is very far-sighted concerning this. And I think that's one of the new strategies that Egypt has been actually following the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. We're not bound to some countries. Yes, diversification we, of exactly. relations. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's not a must that we deal with some specific mm -hmm. countries. You know, yes, some countries in the world, we get it that, you know, as key players, especially economically speaking and politically speaking as well, we get this. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that dealing with a country like Estonia that we stop actually dealing with other countries. It mm -hmm. makes sense, of course. Mm -hmm. However, when dealing with a country like Estonia, I believe it's like opening doors into something like it's a window on something that, okay, that would help us very much with diversifying, as you said, yes. that we quote you on this, on, you know, so many areas, you know, as the, okay, uh, the president said today. Mm. So in my mind, talking about a country like Estonia, it's not only that we have negotiations and we get to sit at a table, you know, and we discuss some issues. I believe that Egypt is looking for non-traditional opportunities, not only economically, but politically as well. Absolutely. 
And let me give you, okay, it's not a simple example, okay, as I said a couple of minutes ago about the ongoing situation in the Middle East. There, okay, the lies that have been propagated and circulated from Tel Aviv, from Israel, around the world about the situation, I think it's believed by some people yes. in the world. Mm -hmm. And I feel it's one of our responsibilities to shed light and tell the truth. On the reality of exactly the situation. Exactly, the reality of the situation mm. to everyone in the world. Mm. So when we go to a country, when we have that uh, high profile visit, okay, it sends a message Australia, in itself. Exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and uh, you know, it's a face to face talk. You yes. know, we get to explain the situation mm -hmm. because when you keep actually, you know, talking to someone, you know, and we keep telling some lie. Okay, for a long time, that's no longer a lie. It becomes less like a fact. So I think it's one of our responsibilities to tell everyone in the world that's what the truth is different. We have to get to know what's going on. And not only what's going on, if you don't mind. We need to highlight the roots of the issue. Mm. Because we've been actually monitoring this, okay, in the last year, that Israel wanting very eagerly to erase the history of the Palestinian crisis mm. of the Palestinian quest. Yes. Mm. Okay, they want only to focus on recent issues, what's going on now, so, and they want to actually, you know, to blind everyone in the world, that's what, no, that it dates back to 1930s and even before yes. 1930s. History scares Tel Aviv, and I mean it. They don't like history. Mm. And they have their own version of history, by the way, of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to put it this way, even in their textbooks, they have a different perception and they have a different narrative mm -hmm. of history. So I believe such talks, such meetings, and I believe, okay, everyone knows that okay, when a, a high-profile visit like this comes to Egypt, it's not only the president, the head of state. The president of state comes with a delegation, Indeed. so people actually supporting and accompanying the president. So we get to know more, we tell them face to face, and we show them, it's not only about some words, okay, we get actually to show them about documents, about, as you said once again, reality of the situation. Reality is not always real, because it largely depends on who actually is telling the narrative. The perception, yes. Exactly, absolutely. the perception. So. Mm -hmm. All right, Dr. Miled, you mentioned uh, several important points which I'll try to dissect with you uh, before we run out of time. Uh, President, in President Abdel Fattah Sisi's address today, he spoke about the escalating tensions in Gaza and Lebanon. Uh, in your opinion, what are some of the world views, like for example a country like Estonia from Europe, how do they see the steps that Egypt is taking to mediate uh, the situation on the ground and uh, you know, aiming to prevent further violence? First of all, they need to understand what the exact situation is. Mm. And I think Egypt and what Egypt has been doing the last year, I think everyone knows about this in the world. Mm. Okay, with one exception, and we all know what that exception is. Mm -hmm. It's Tel Aviv that doesn't want, and she, they don't want to know about what's happening, of course. Mm. They, have, they have chosen to ignore all of this. However, I think Europe, little by little, and let me remind you, our dear viewers, when that war started, Okay, I think Europe took a very actually strict stance against what Palestinians, and they said, okay, with that kind of, uh, you know, repetitive talk, a repetitive statement that, okay, uh, self-defense of Israel, okay, they have the right to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. And little by little, okay, that the situation has changed in Europe. And we have seen, you know, European countries actually taking the side of Palestinians, even recognizing, mm. okay, the state of Palestine. So I think, and I think one of the key factors in getting such countries to recognize the real situation is Egypt. I think Egypt is so pivotal. Egypt has been playing a very active role. Indeed. Engaging into this face-to-face, -face. by the way. I think, not I think, I strongly believe that, mm -hmm. that our diplomatic invoices, the delegation across Europe, they have been doing a magnificent job letting everyone know about the situation Indeed. in the Middle East. So I think Egypt and Estonia, and I think okay, they, they know that, okay, that the situation and the real, what the real situation is, and I think Egypt is trying to get European countries on our side. Mm -hmm. As we go to the international organization, they would fully support us. Yes, absolutely. Because that's very crucial. Indeed. And we have seen this, okay, in the 
General Assembly of the United Nations. Nations yes, indeed. Um, right, so as you mentioned, any visitor or head of state that comes usually is accompanied by delegation, ministers, uh, private sector, business persons, etc. With Estonian uh, investors and business leaders eager to explore uh, opportunities in Egypt, which sectors do you see as most promising uh, for foreign investment and what incentives have been offered to attract uh, such investments here? On their side, mm -hmm. the expertise that they have, and I think we should, you know, fully exploit Indeed. this, is the, you know, technology. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe some people, they, they would get shocked, you know, Estonia, mm -hmm. they are advanced at technology, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, especially when it comes to fields like cybersecurity, yes. and, you know, a database, and, okay, uh, you know, IT, different IT fields. So they are actually, you know, advanced, really advanced in that direction. Hmm. And I think Egypt needs this, and Egypt has been aiming at this. Yes. Because actually, you know, the digital infrastructure, by the way, infrastructure is not only about bridges and roads. And of course, we all know the real crucial of bridges and roads, but we have other bridges and roads. Yes. We have digital bridges and roads, hmm. you know, and those invisible roads and bridges I wouldn't say more important, but they are pretty crucial, mm -hmm. you know, especially in the world that we live in nowadays. Yes. We cannot make it without technology. To me, technology is like a compulsory question nowadays. Mm -hmm. We have to answer this question. And countries not knowing how to answer this question, I think they are in a very big problem. Mm -hmm. So when we get to cooperate with a country like Estonia in this kind of field, I think Egypt is seeking once again non-traditional solutions, non-traditional partners. Okay, for example, as we go east to China as well, like Estonia, seeking that kind of path, you know, to cooperate, you know, in the field of technology, because most countries, they go west, as we all know. Yes. So we are trying once again to diversify even in the, you know, the area yes. of what, mm. of technology. Yes. On our side, you know, Estonians, Okay, for example, when it comes to tourism, you know, because the weather there is so harsh, mm -hmm. the climate of the country is not, you know, pleasant mm -hmm. as the hours. Okay, but we were, I wouldn't say we're lucky, we're gifted as Egyptians. Yes, indeed, we are blessed with wonderful exactly. weather. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I think when we get Estonians, and this region, not only Estonians, because we have adjacent countries like Latvia, like mm -hmm. some other countries, because, you know, the word of mouth spreads out very easily. Yes. So I think... It, we would be opening new doors. So tourism needs that kind of initiative. So when we actually receive a high-profile delegation like the Estonian one, I think we're really smart, that's what I want to say, because actually, you know, tourism, you know, has to be, you know, moved. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to take some active steps towards this and towards actually getting, you know, new tourists from new areas, okay, in the world. And of course, we have other fields to cooperate on both sides, the Egyptian side and the Estonian side as well. Absolutely right. Let's move to some uh, other news as well today. Uh, during a press conference uh, Wednesday with the Dutch Foreign Minister, Kasper Veldkamp, the Egyptian Foreign Minister, Dr. Badr Abdel Ghati, spoke about Egypt's uh, pivotal regional and international role highlighted through the multifaceted partnerships as well, including deepening ties with the Netherlands. We have more details on this very important uh, event and visit, and we'll be back to continue today's edition of the Daily Debate. Stay tuned. During a press conference on Wednesday with Dutch Foreign Minister Kasper Waldkamp, Foreign Minister Dr. Badr Abdelati underscored Egypt's pivotal regional and international role highlighted through its multifaceted partnerships, including deepening ties with the Netherlands. Abdelati emphasized that the Dutch Foreign Minister's visit marks a new chapter in Egyptian-Dutch relations showing both countries' commitment to expanding cooperation across political, economic and cultural domains. This high-level visit also aligns with recent discussions between President Sisi and the Dutch Prime Minister to enforce cooperation on issues of mutual interest including economic investment, food security and logistics. Both ministers noted the growing presence of Dutch companies in Egypt with opportunities for further investment under Egypt's pro-business reforms including recent tax incentives passed by the Egyptian parliament. Dr. Abdelati underscored the appeal of Egypt's investment landscape supported by government policies encouraging foreign investment.
Among strategic sectors for collaboration, Abdelati and the World Camp discuss advancements in the logistics sector where the Netherlands holds a distinct advantage with Rotterdam, one of the world's largest ports. Both countries see potential in developing Egypt's logistics infrastructure, positioning it as a regional hub for trade and transport. Minister Abdelati further addressed shared concerns on regional crises, particularly the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip. The discussions highlighted Egypt's diplomatic efforts to mediate peace between Israel and Hamas, which the Dutch Foreign Minister lauded. Both ministers expressed support for a two-state solution, with Egypt advocating for a Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital, emphasizing the urgency of supporting UN mandates. Through strategic partnerships like that with the Netherlands, Egypt is positioning itself as a stabilizing force in the Middle East, actively promoting peace, sustainable development and cross-border cooperation. This approach not only strengthens Egypt's regional influence, but also aligns with border international objectives, enhancing its global standing. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, still with tonight's edition of the Daily Debate and moving to this very important visit from the Dutch Foreign Minister. How do you see this visit as symbolizing, uh, if you may, a new chapter when it comes to Egyptian-Dutch relations? What unique opportunities does it present for the two countries? Uh, can you imagine that we're moving from northeast of Europe yes. to northwest of Europe? Yes. And that proves my point mm -hmm. that okay and as you said once again the diversification yes. we were talking about a country that okay northeast mm. of Europe and now we're talking about Netherlands and Netherlands actually is a very popular country in Europe okay by the way most of the people maybe they were thinking that's only like France Britain you know Germany the leading figures mm -hmm. or the leading countries mm -hmm. you know in Europe but however you know a country like Netherlands by the way especially when it comes to logistics as we heard in the report. Mm -hmm. By the way, that's one of the leading countries in the world. You know, despite the fact that size wise Netherlands is not a vast country. Yes. Mm -hmm. However, logistically speaking, when it comes to logistics, and by the way, that's a very profitable business in the world. I, I know that some people underestimate this and they don't play this kind of business. Mm -hmm. However, if we focus on that kind of business, especially Egypt is so potential. You know, the coasts that we have, you know, and the ports that we have, and I think we spent billions of dollars the last 10 years developing such ports, yes. and actually we need to see the fruits, and we wouldn't be able to see such fruits without cooperating with major players in that field like Netherlands. Indeed. So when we talk about, okay, Rotterdam, okay, or, okay, other ports or other countries in the world, okay, I think that we need to keep in mind that business needs to be seen differently. Business needs to be done differently and approached differently as well. And that's what we see from the Egyptian government dealing with Estonia, dealing with Netherlands. And I think, you know, Netherlands, okay, we need actually to join forces with that country yes. as soon as possible, building new bridges business-wise, getting investors. And I've heard something else in the report. I'd like to, you know, shed light on if you don't mind. Sure. Those actually, you know, businessmen coming from Netherlands wanted to do business in Egypt and they have some companies here in Egypt. I've heard something which is very important that, okay, facilitating their business, you know, the regulation, the laws, you know, and especially, you know, okay, that uh, maybe some complexities or, or some regulations. And we've been hearing from the prime minister and from different officials in the government that, okay, that we've been facilitating this. And we've, uh, I think we have heard of something called the Golden License. Yes, of course. Which has been in use now for a, a couple great incentive, of years. Yes. And yeah, it is truly, uh, mm -hmm. okay, it's an incentive, mm -hmm. and a very evident one. Yes. So when we deal with Netherlands, and when we sit at a table, and we discuss everything regarding business openly, and I mean it openly. Mm. So if they have any complaints about whatever, so we have actually to act immediately on this. And that's what we see in the prime minister. Yes. That's what we see in the Egyptian cabinet. Mm -hmm. Okay, all together, they mean it and they work very 
actually actively on this, facilitating and opening new doors, welcoming everyone, okay, in the world. And uh, one of such countries actually is Netherlands. Absolutely. So, you know, th this kind of a step is very important, you know, mm -hmm. when it comes to regulations and laws. It's not only paperwork. It's not only paperwork because if I get a businessman from Netherlands and he would see that it would take him, what, let's say a year to set up actually his to business, set up his business mm -hmm. I think that would be very difficult to him. Mm -hmm. And he would reconsider yes. this kind of offer and, mm -hmm. you know, doing business here in Egypt. Mm -hmm. So, and I think, you know, it's very much the opposite nowadays. Yes. Okay, that we've been trying to facilitate and, you know, to get people to understand that, okay, you know, you have more and more opportunities. It's very actually, you know, the economic actually climate is so welcoming and we mean it and we act upon this in Egypt. Indeed, and we have a lot to offer in this regard. Exactly. Uh, now, Egypt, as you said, is, has a strategic location, um, you know, ge geographically even, to enhance um, its value as a logistics partner, really, for the Netherlands as well, as you said, especially considering as you mentioned, Dutch expertise in this specific field. How do you see, uh, you know, Egypt positioning itself as a regional trade and logistics hub? We haven't been doing this for a while, mm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. We have been actually, you know, thinking, because we all know that, okay, Egypt is an agrarian country, you know, okay, historically speaking. And uh, we, ha we started changing that kind of, you know, the profile, the picture that we put on our profile mm. since 1960s. Unfortunately, there were ups and downs. And I think in the last 10 years, we have been trying to change everything considering yeah. this. You know, we've been trying to, you know, as the, we need to see the real face of Egypt, economically speaking. And as you said, it's not only potential. We have like endless opportunities. You know, our location, in my mind, and I'm not exaggerating, I mean it, it's one of a kind. Absolutely. It's one of a kind. Let's consider any country in the Middle East. I know, for example, the Gulf states, with all due respect, okay, with other countries like Morocco, for example, it's, uh, you know, uh, you know, the location of Morocco is very distinctive. However, Egypt, because of the Swiss Canal, because of the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea, and I think, you know, and uh, the very easy access to Asia to the east, you know, Africa and Europe to the north, mm. and I think it's what... We, we are never actually lacking anything to take advantage of our wonderful, okay, you know, beneficial, you know, location. So when we actually, you know, join forces, as I said, with countries like Netherlands, mm. I think, okay, we, we have to do this, as I said earlier. We have to. Uh, it's never enough when doing business. Okay, we have to seek different opportunities. And, you know, we have to take advantage of our location yeah, I know, actually, some would say, touristically speaking, we have been doing great regarding this, especially when it comes to the North Coast or the East Coast, mm -hmm. I would call it, mm -hmm. here now on the, on the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, touristically speaking, we have we've been doing a great job. But when it comes to logistics, when it comes to trade, I think, you know, it's time now to take active actions regarding this. And that's why we see, for example, the economic zone, you know, of the Suez Canal, and the Sokhna and the ports there on the Red Sea and the developments, different developments, I think we are heading in the right direction regarding Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Millet, just before we wrap up, I'm afraid we're running out of time. How do you see, uh, you know, the significance of Egypt and the Netherlands, uh, uh, even on a political front? They discussed a joint uh, support for a two-state solution, their cooperation. Uh, do you see further cooperation in this regard to push for the idea of a two-state solution and, as you said, spread it to other countries uh, in the continent of Europe? Uh, once again, it's mm -hmm. back to the Middle East, okay? So I strongly believe that uh, Europe needs to join forces with, okay, the countries in the Middle East. There has been some sort of a gap, okay, regarding the views mm -hmm. of the two regions and even regarding some very crucial issues like illegal migration and whatsoever. So I think it's time to get Europeans and Middle Easterns, generally speaking, I'm talking about the Arab countries and other countries as well in the Middle East, to sit at one table and to discuss everything openly, as I said, not only economically, I mean politically speaking, because, you know, the gap is very much possible to be bridges, and there has to be bridges. And as I said, you know, a couple of minutes ago as well, we have been seeing European countries join forces with us, mm -hmm. like Spain, for example, like in Norway, 
that's another example. So which actually proved that it is very much it's possible to this. It's receptive of such yeah, an idea. Mm -hmm. it's possible. Mm -hmm. And I think the best solution is to do diplomacy the right way, as we said in the beginning. Doing diplomacy, it's time actually, you know, as we were talking about Estonia, for example. We need actually to get everyone to understand the reality, okay, what's going on. And once again, if you don't mind, I need to stress once again on sure. history. Mm. It's very important, okay. It, history actually, you know, the memory of history is very strong. People don't forget. The Nakba is unforgettable, by the way, that happened in 1948. I think Israelis will not be able to get us to forget about this and forget about the different massacres and the different, you know, and ongoing torture and agony, you know, that being inflicted on Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Doctor. Finally, uh, looking ahead, what are some of the main milestones that you think both uh, Egypt and the Netherlands aim to achieve over the next year through different partnerships? What benchmarks do you see determining their progress? Economically speaking, mm -hmm. the door is very much open. Very good. Okay, mm -hmm. so, you know, doing business, a businessman is always hungry, you know, that, you know, is always eager, mm -hmm. okay, to do more business. Okay, like Mr. Donald Trump, yes. you know, you know, so that's why I believe our appetite is very much actually ready for now business wise. Egyptians are very much ready to do this right now. Mm -hmm. So cooperating with a country like Netherlands will open like endless doors to us. Absolutely. On that very, very positive note, I'd like to thank you very, very much. Dr. Miled Montez, our international relations expert. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, sir, for coming in this evening and for joining us on The Daily Debate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time we have for tonight's edition of The Daily Debate. You're in the company of myself, Angie Meher. Thank you for watching.